Praise the Lord. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 through 5. And I'm coming from the New American Standard Bible translation. Thank God for you all. Thank God, musicians, for you. Amen. Thank God for the praise team. Can you give all of them a hand? Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, God. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 through 5. Are you there? I'm coming from the New American Standard Bible translation as we are standing in reverence for the word of God. It says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. And some of your translations may say they have itching ears. Uh, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and, and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You may be seated in the house of God. As we continue, uh, let's recap uh, from last week. Uh, we know that Timothy uh, was the newly installed pastor of a large church, and he would need to be a courageous pastor. How many of you know it takes courage to preach the word of God? <laughs> Especially in today's world, it takes courage to stick to the text. <laughs> not one, <laughs> he, he could not be one who would wilt under pressure, because he was going to need to confront error and defend truth. Right. Last week, there were two main points. Uh, we looked at, number one, the solemn charge. And the essence of the charge, as we uh, said last week, uh, is summed up in three words. Preach the word. What Paul is saying here to Timothy was not to be taken lightly. It was not a suggestion, but a solemn charge. And I believe the New American Standard Bible translation captures the deeper meaning of the original Greek word dia martyroma, which means warn or testify solemnly. And your notes uh, are, are there on your app also. Uh, this is an important matter that he is exhorting him to never abandon. How many of you know we cannot leave the word of God? And Paul is not issuing his charge in his own name or on his own authority, but in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, and therefore conscious of divine direction and approval. There are four things that we mentioned last week that uh, I believe this solemn charge is meant to do. Number one, this solemn charge is meant to remind him of who he ultimately serves. How many of you know it doesn't matter what people say? Yeah. Ultimately, you will have to give an account to God. Doesn't matter who doesn't like you, doesn't matter who doesn't like what you're saying, ultimately you will have to give an account to God. Did you please God with your life? Because see those people that you're trying to please, guess what? They're going to die too. <laughs> they don't have a heaven or a hell to put you in. You have to stick to what God's word says and serve him and glorify him. Paul wanted uh, Timothy to know, don't let the false teachers discouragement and those who don't like you cause you to throw in the towel. You have to keep in mind it is God you are serving. Number two that we learned last week, this solemn charge is meant to help him remain focused on the task at hand. How many of you know there's many distractions in the world? Many things that can distract us. You know, we can get our eyes off of God and get them on other things. No, we got to stay focused. Like, like you, see, you ever seen a horse with, with the blinders on? That's to keep that horse focused. It's time for the church to get focused on the task at hand so that people can be saved and get back to the preaching of the word of God. The third thing, last week we said this solemn charge was meant to do. The solemn charge is meant to help him resist the urge to quit. The reward for serving God is too great to quit on. We have to hold on and persevere. Jesus is coming back. How many of you know that? Jesus is coming 
back and we have to keep pressing forward. The fourth thing we learned that the solemn charge was meant to do is to cause him to remember that his reward was coming from the Lord. Likewise, we have to also remember that our reward comes from the Lord. Colossians 3, 22 through 24 says, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. When you go to your job tomorrow, you're not actually working for that company. <laughs> you're actually working for the Lord. You are a kingdom citizen. Those, those revenues that you get from working on that job, guess what? You're supposed to funnel some of that into the kingdom. You're a kingdom citizen, supposed to be following kingdom rule, representing Christ in everything that you do. And last week we said that uh, uh, Paul was giving him, the second point was, uh, the steadfast commitment. So we gave him a solemn charge. Then there was a steadfast commitment. And we have to take note that he told Timothy to preach the word, not a word. Preach the word. That's the, the word of God, the holy scriptures, not a word from man. Because there's a lot of stuff floating around out there, in case you haven't noticed. There's a lot of teaching going on right now in the world today. Even at some churches right now, as I'm standing before you right now, there's some stuff being preached at some church somewhere in the world that has nothing to do with this book. They don't even need to bring the book to the pulpit. No Bible at all being preached. Paul shows Timothy there are two th times when he should preach the word. He has to be ready when it's convenient and when it's inconvenient. And we showed how the word of God is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And here was an important part of last week's message that I said, uh, we have no liberty to invent our message. We have no liberty to invent our message, but only communicate the word which God has spoken and has now committed to us, the church, as a sacred trust. So today we'll continue with point number three, and that is the shifting culture. There's the solemn charge, the steadfast commitment, and the shifting culture. How many of you can see that the culture, when it comes to the things of God, is shifting? Paul tells Timothy that the time will come when they won't endure sound doctrine. The word endure in the Greek is anekomai, and it means to endure or bear with. And the sense that it is used in the text is to permit without opposing or prohibiting. But in the times Paul is referring to, which had already started, and we, we kind of touched on that a little bit last week, and you can see from reading uh, 1 and 2 Timothy, these, these times of uh, uh, people not enduring sound doctrine had already begun in Timothy's time. They're worse now, but it already started back then. But Paul is saying that people will oppose and prohibit sound doctrine, which brings us to needing to gain an understanding of what sound doctrine is. And I'm just giving you a few uh, Greek words in this message because it's important because it pulls out the deeper meaning of what's being said. Sometimes you have to do that. I don't like to really overload y'all with that kind of stuff, but sometimes you have to dig into that to pull out the deeper meaning of what's being said. Amen? Amen. So the Greek word for sound in our text, is hagiano, and it means healthy. And this is all in your notes. The sense that it is used here is to be correct or accurate, conceived as being free from infirmity or disease. So in other words, free from error. Healthy doctrine is not error-filled doctrine. Healthy doctrine is in accordance with the text, the Bible, the Word of God. The sense that it is used is to be correct, to be accurate, uh, conceived as being free from infirmity or disease. Doctrine is the Greek word didaskali. It means discipline or training. The sense it's used is a doctrine or collection of doctrines that is taught. Sound doctrine then is healthy training that is correct and accurate and free from infirmity and disease or error. So Paul listed four characteristics that would be indicators that the time that Paul is referring to has come. 
Here's what the Lord showed me here that is simply taken right from the text before us this morning. Number one, people will hate the truth. In the last days, in the, in the times when people will not endure sound doctrine, people will hate the truth. That's essentially what he is saying by people will not endure sound doctrine. They will oppose it. Anybody have any examples of people opposing the word of God in our culture today, our shifting culture? They will prohibit it because it does not agree with them. And I found it interesting that Paul told Timothy to be ready in season, that's a key word, season, and out of season, because when you think of a season, you think of a point in time. So when I think of fall, for example, you know, I was born in November in the, in the fall time, greatest time of the year. You know, if, if you weren't born in November, you might not actually be saved. I don't know. No, I'm just joking with you. <laughs> you know, when you think of fall, you think of leaves turning color. Think of Thanksgiving. Yeah. You think of, you know, different smells and different you know, things going on. You, know, you think of, you know, that uh, 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 sweet potato pie. You know, y'all look like y'all getting hungry now. You think of that turkey and the dressing. Yeah, y'all going there. Yeah. When you think of summertime, you think of roasting like a pig at a luau in Texas. We're just all burning up. You could probably cook an egg on the sidewalk. It's just miserable heat <laughs> in Texas. My God. <laughs> when you think of wintertime, we don't know what we're going to get. It could be summer, fall, winter, spring, all in one in the wintertime in Texas. When you think of spring, you think of, you know, how the flowers are starting to bloom and the blue bonnets and all of these kinds of things. The point I want you to connect the dots on is that Paul said the time would come or the season would come when they would not endure healthy training that is correct and accurate and free from infirmity and disease or error. So it seems like Paul is letting Timothy know that there was coming a time or a season when the word of God will be viewed as out of season. Remember, he told him be ready in season or out of season, or it will be unpopular by some while being embraced by others. And whether they embrace the word or some excoriate the word, which is to denounce or berate severely, he had to be ready either way, but nevertheless, he had to be encouraged and keep preaching the word of God. If they hated him, preach the word of God. If they loved on him, don't take it to heart. Don't drink your own Kool-Aid. Just keep preaching the word of God. No, it ain't about you. It's about the word of God. Maybe you did do a great message. Give God the praise. Keep rolling on. Don't stay there too long. It's not about you. Keep preaching the word of God. Just by show of hands, how many of you know that your life is really not about you? Yeah, the things that you possess don't even belong to you. You're just a steward. So you thought you did something by, you know, buying that car or buying that house or that, that fancy, you know, those fancy clothes or whatever. You're just a steward of what you have. And guess what? Because when you leave here, you're not taking any of that with you. There are no caddies in heaven. No Cadillacs driving around in heaven. Not there. You can't take it with you. You're just a steward of what God blesses you with. Here's another thing that I can see here from the text that Paul was letting Timothy know. First of all, people will hate the truth. Secondly, people will hear the lies. They want their ears tickled, and they have itching ears, as some translations say. And the word in the Greek for tickled is kinetho. And that word tickled is uh, in harmony with translations that say uh, itching ears, because when you look up that Greek word, it means uh, itch or feel in itching. And the sense that's used there is to have, to, per, uh, to have or perceive an irritating sensation with a desire to scratch it. So uh, just uh, as a reference point, when you have an itch, when something's itching on your arm, itches, your, your ear, your, your head, or whatever, you want to get rid of it, right? Yeah, whatever is causing that itch, you want to get rid of it. Keep that in mind. 
When you have an itch, you usually do something to get rid of what is causing the irritation. And I submit to you that what is causing the irritation in the case of those with itching ears is the word of God. Because it is not what they want to hear and the thing that is able to get rid of the irritation, in their opinion, is unbiblical teaching. The unbiblical teaching or the lies is not irritating, but soothing to their ears. This sounds very much like the people in Isaiah, the 30th chapter, verse 9 through 11. It says there, for this is a rebellious people, false sons, sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord who say to the seers, you must not see visions. And to the prophets, you must not prophesy to us what is right. Can you, you see that? They're literally telling the prophets, don't tell us what God is saying. Speak to us pleasant words. Prophesy illusions. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Let me explain what's going on in Timothy's day that satisfied uh, the itching ears or satisfied those that wanted to hear what they wanted to hear. And how many of you know that in today's world, there are people that want to hear what they want to hear? Yeah. Now, now everybody's not just embracing the word. Everybody's not, oh, my gosh, I can't wait till Sunday to go hear the word of God. Man, just can't wait. Everybody's not doing that because, see, everybody's not embracing the word of God through the week. So they're certainly not waiting for Sunday. They want to hear something that is going to soothe their ears to let them know that what they're doing is okay. God still loves me. Even though I'm sleeping around all over town, God is still love. God loves me. I am loved of God. And then they get sent back out the church and they go through the week not even knowing that what they're doing is wrong and that lifestyle can send them straight to hell forever. See, that's something that people don't say anymore in church. So I don't want people to go to hell from Round Rock. I want to make it hard for you to go to hell from Round Rock, Texas. I'm not going to stand in front of the Lord. Hear me when I say this. I'm not going to stand in front of God and God ask me, well, why didn't you, how come you just totally ignored my book? How come you were just so interested in just making people shout and, 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 and run around and all that kind of stuff? No, no, no. I want people to be able to have a relationship with God and a solid understanding of the word of God. Amen? In Timothy's day, it was tragically easy to find false teachers. They were called sophist, S-O-P-H-I-S-T-S. Sophist, and they wandered from city to city, offering to teach anything in return for money. <laughs> I submit to you, sophists still exist. There are people right now, if you tell them, hey, you know what? I can give you this much money if you'll come and say this to my people. Yeah. There are people running scams in churches right now. Matter of fact, there was a story about uh, this one church that had paid people uh, to pretend that they were dead, and the, the preacher was like bringing them back from the dead. But these people were pra pa uh, paid to do that. <laughs> Can't believe everything you see on, 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 in, on the Internet. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute. Everything on the Internet is true. I forgot, I forgot about that. <laughs> if it's on the Internet, it must be true. Isocrates, a man by the name of Isocrates, an Athenian orator, said of them, they tried to attract pupils by low fees and big promises. They would teach people to argue subtly and to use clever words until they could make the worse appear the better reason. Plato described them savagely. He said they were hunters after young men of wealth and position with sham education as their bait and a fee for their object, making money by a scientific use of quibbles in private conversation while quite aware that what they are teaching is wrong. In the days of Timothy, people were surrounded by false teachers offering them sham knowledge. Sounds like not much has changed today. Their deliberate policy was to find arguments whereby people could justify anything they wanted to. 
People do that today. But here's the thing. Remember this. Any teacher. How many? Any teacher. Even today whose teaching tends to make people think less of sin is a menace to Christianity and to society as a whole. Hear that. What the Lord spoke to me concerning this hearing of lies and the shifting of the culture is that, first of all, they will shift to receive what is entertaining. If you can string together enough catchy one-liners in today's world, you can lull people to sleep And they'll totally miss the fact that what you're saying has little to do with what the Bible wants us to know. He said they will shift to revile what is authentic. So they will shift to receive what is entertaining. People will shift to revile what is authentic. Many people make the mistake of saying that men wrote the Bible as if they dreamed up all 66 books by themselves in an attempt to discredit its teachings. People who make such false accusations are merely trying to appease their own consciences and justify their wrongdoings and sinful behavior. The fact of the matter is that if you study how we got the Bible, you would be left fully persuaded that the Bible is without a doubt the Word of God. And as such, we need it more than anything else. I know that for most doubters and most haters, uh, it's not enough to say that people are just wrong. So let me give you something to support the fact that the Bible is authentic. In uh, 2 Peter uh, uh, 1, verse 21, it says, For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. It is apparent that many of the writers did not know the other writers of Scripture. It wasn't a conspiracy. They were, not, they were unfamiliar with the other writings inasmuch as the writers wrote over a period of more than 1,500 years, yet the Bible is a marvelous unified whole. There are no contradictions, no inconsistencies within the pages of the Bible. The Holy Spirit is the unifier of the 66 books, determining its consistency in unity with, these, uh, with the Trinity of God. And the deity of Christ, the personality of the Holy Spirit, the fallen depravity of man, as well as salvation by grace, it's all in the pages of Scripture. It quickly becomes apparent that no human being or no humans could have orchestrated the Bible just by chance. Divine authorship of the Bible is the only answer. Here's another thing that I saw concerning this this, uh, hearing of the lies, is that they will shift to revise what is right. The Bible needs no updates. Let me say that again. The Bible needs no updates. You ever see on your phone, you get that notice that there's a a, a system update, and you click on that thing. Sometimes it comes at the most inconvenient time. System update. You update your phone and all that kind of thing. Guess what? The Bible doesn't need an update. But there are people trying to revise the Word of God. We live in a day when churches are even saying the Bible is too harsh and they're trying to soften the message so it's more palatable to the world and to believers. It's told that many, many years ago while on a visit to England, a wealthy businessman was fascinated by a powerful microscope. Looking through its lens to study crystals and the petals of flowers, he was amazed at their beauty and detail. He decided to purchase a microscope and take it back home. He thoroughly enjoyed using it until one day he examined some food he was planning to eat for dinner. (laughs) Much to his dismay, he discovered that tiny living creatures were crawling in it. Since he was especially fond of this particular food, he wondered what to do. Finally, he concluded that there was only one way out of his dilemma. He would destroy the instrument that caused him to discover the distasteful fact. So he smashed the microscope to pieces. How foolish, you might say. But here's the thing. People do the same thing with the word of God. They hate it and they would like to get rid of it because it reveals their evil nature. People will shift to receive what is entertaining. 
They will shift to revile what is authentic. They will shift to revise what is right. And they will shift to reject what is sound. The word of God is rejected. And the word of man is applauded because it soothes the ear and brings no conviction. The Bible is necessary, is as necessary to our safe passage through this lifetime as oxygen is to sustain life. Paul shows us people will hate the truth. They will hear the lies. He also shows us, number three, people will hype the counterfeit. That's the false teachers. The word episorio means to heap or accumulate and the idea is that they gather a large number of teachers. They don't just gather, you know, get one teacher to satisfy uh, the itch in their ears. They get a whole lot of people. Why? Because uh, if they have a, a large number, it seems to validate the very thing that they're trying to say is right. If enough people are teaching the same false doctrine, then it must be right is what they believe. But nothing could be further from the truth. Now, of course, I know there are some in the world that uh, would say that the language I'm using, again, is, is too harsh and we need to, you know, soften the message of the Bible. But the Bible itself points out the fact in our text here today and there, that there are some who are counterfeit teachers. And it more explicitly identifies these people in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 12 through 15. You can turn there if you like. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 12 through 15. Paul said there, but what I am doing, I will continue to do so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the matter about which they are boasting. Here it is. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. How many of you know if people did that then, don't you know that people are doing that now? No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Notice that the method by which they judge teachers, these, these people who won't hear sound doctrine, the method that they judge teachers is not as it should be God's word, but their own subjective taste. Worse still, they do not first listen and then decide whether what they have heard is true. They first decide what they want to hear and then select teachers who will oblige them by telling them what they want to hear. How is Timothy supposed to react to this? One might guess that such a desperate situation that he was in, that he was supposed to be silent. If men can't bear the truth and will not listen to it, surely the right course would be for him to hold his peace, right? Just be quiet. But Paul reaches the opposite conclusion. He must not take his lead from the prevailing fashions of the day. He must preach the word, and we must do the same thing here today. Paul shows us people will hate the truth. People will hear the lies. They will hype the counterfeit. And number four that we see in our text, people will hail false doctrine. H-A-I-L, hail false doctrine. You might say, what does that mean? Well, to hail something simply means to acclaim or approve enthusiastically. How many of you see in our world today, there are people that are enthusiastically approving stuff that has nothing to do with the word of God? And if you bring up the word of God, they'll be like, well, wow, that, that's, you know, that's hateful. That's wrong. Some will even say that the Bible needs to change. <laughs> How do we change the Bible? Come on, really? You want us to rewrite the word of God? That's the world that we're living in. People want to change. They, they want to heap up false teachers for themselves because they have itching ears. They will hail false doctrine. Not only was it happening in Timothy's time, it happens even more in our day. The context of Paul's writing seems to indicate that these people were at one time in tune with the truth. And at some point, they turned to myth. See, you can't turn away from something if you're not looking in that direction. They turned to myths. This is called apostasy. 
which is an abandonment of the faith. We see in 1 Timothy 4 and 1, it says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Do you see that? He says that in later times, are we in later times? Absolutely. Can we see that a lot of people have fallen away from the faith? Absolutely. And I believe the saddest thing about rejecting God's truth is that a person can live their whole life believing counterfeit man-made truth to appeal to and appease their sinful flesh and end up tormented in hell when all the evidence they needed to prove God was around them their whole life. Yet in their attempt to be wiser than God who made them, they became fools. If they stood before God today to account for their lives, the most eloquent, grammatically correct, spell check, error free speech they can come up with will be as worthless as the time they took to craft it. Paul, in light of all the evidence, has provided a, a, a text in Romans where he says that they are without excuse. How is it that people can turn from truth to error? You ever known anybody like that? It seemed like they were running strong for Christ, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're, you know, running around with some crazy doctrine. You're like, what's wrong with you? One moment they were, you know, praising God. Next moment they're like, you know, totally opposed to anything that God has to say. How is it that people can turn from truth to error? Three things that I want to show you here that I believe that is the reason why people can turn from truth to error. Number one, their eyes look into error. <laughs> they start examining things that are out of text, are out of line with the word of God. They start looking at it. Their ears listen to error, teaching that is wrong. And their mouths lead others to error. Why? Because their hearts are so full of that erroneous doctrine that now they are saying the same thing. But here's the thing. The key to avoiding falling into error is to guard your heart. In the world that we live in today, when there's so much social media and you're bombarded by so many things, the thing is you have to guard your heart. Anybody ever used a compass? Yeah, I was in the military, so I've used a compass many times. And here's the thing about a compass. A compass always says the same thing. A compass will not have you going north when you're really supposed to be going south. If it's north, then it's north. If it's south, then it's south. If it's east, it's east. If it's west, it's west. What am I saying? I'm telling you that in your life, you have a compass that will always steer you in the right direction, and that compass is the Word of God. It will always tell you what is right. It will always tell you how to live right. It will always tell you how to, to, how to correct yourself. It will rebuke. It will exhort. It will encourage. The word of God is always right. It never speaks against itself. So you have to be careful what you allow your ears to see, to hear, what your eyes are to see. You have to be careful about what your mouth is allowed to speak. Keep your eyes in the word of God, your ears tuned to the word of God, and your mouth speaking the word of God, and you will stay on course. So Paul tells Timothy in verse number five there, he says, but you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. What does he mean by be sober in all things? Be alert. Be alert. Be observant of the times that you're in. Endure hardship. What does he mean? Well, of course, it will be hard to see people turn away from the truth to myths, but you've got to understand they're going to talk about you. They're going to do things that you might not like, do things to you that they won't like, but you have to continue on. You have to endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. I don't believe he's telling him to go and become an evangelist because remember, he's the pastor of the Ephesian church. So he's not telling him to leave the church and go do the work of an evangelist like travel around. But he's saying, keep preaching to them the good news of the word of God. Keep preaching the gospel. And then he says, fulfill your ministry. 
Basically, what he's saying there is do your ministry until it's all over with. Leave it all on the field. Do everything you're supposed to do. Those difficult days in which it was hard to gain a hearing for the gospel were not to discourage Timothy, nor to deter him from his ministry, nor to induce him to trim his message to suit his hearers, still less to silence him altogether but rather was to spur him on to preach the more. It should be the same still with us. When we see difficult times, it's not time to get quiet. It's time to keep pressing forward all the more. The harder the times and the deafer the people, the clearer and the more persuasive our proclamation must be. As one person said, uh, John Calvin, in fact, uh, not supporting Calvinism or anything, but this statement he made is right on point. He said, the more determined men become to despise the teaching of Christ, the more zealous should godly ministers be to assert it, and the more strenuous their efforts to preserve it entire, and more than that, by their diligence to ward off Satan's attacks. Preach the word is what Paul told Timothy. That was his charge to him. And one person said, one writer said, uh, we are not to preach sociology, but salvation. Not economics, but evangelism. Not reform, but redemption. Not culture, but conversion. Not progress, but pardon. Not a new social order, but a new birth. Not revolution, but regeneration. Not renovation, but revival. Not resuscitation, but resurrection. Not a new organization, but a new creation. Not democracy, but the gospel. Not civilization, but Christ. We are ambassadors, not diplomats. And we must preach the word and remain steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor will not be in vain. Can you give God some praise in the house today?